let's talk about power factor correction. But before that, a review. In AC steady state, we concern ourselves with four types of power. S, apparent power, in volt amperes, in kVA, in MVA. P, active power, also known as average power, in watts, kilowatts, megawatts. Q, reactive power also known in our classroom as ping-pong power, remember, in volt ampere reactive, in kilovars, in megavars. And uh, putting the three of them together into a single complex number container, we have S with a hat, complex power, a complex number, also given in volt amperes, in KVAs, or in MVAs. The relationship between those powers brings in the power factor. The power factor depends on the relative phase of voltage and current. We always talk about the current. We say the current is lagging, the current is leading the voltage in the load or in the source. The power factor can be inductive and we call that lagging, of course, because the current is lagging in an inductive load. Or we can say the power factor is capacitive in cases where the current is leading, and we also call that a, a leading power factor. So the power factor is a cosine. A cosine of what? A cosine of the phase of the voltage, alpha, minus the phase of the current, beta. Hmm. So if we have a phase of the voltage 10 degrees like here, and the phase of the current is 40 degrees, then the power factor is the cosine of 10 minus 40, cosine of negative 30, which is a positive number, 0 0.87. Right. But what about if the situation is reversed and the voltage is the one with 40 degrees and the current is lagging with only 10 degrees of phase. In that case, the power factor is the cosine of 40 minus 10, which is the cosine of 30, positive 30, which is again the same 0 0.87. So you see, in both cases, the scenario is different, but the power factor is the same. So we have to use another word to specify that the power factor corresponds to a a lagging situation with so or a leading situation. In the first case, we say, hey, the current is leading. Or we say this is a capacitive power factor. So in that case, we say the power factor is 87% leading. Or you could also say it is 87% capacitive. In the second case, because in that case the current is lagging, we say the power factor is 87% lagging or 87% inductive, which is exactly the same. We have seen before that in AC steady state, power in an impedance, or in a source for that matter, is a sinusoidal function of time. And it has twice the frequency of the sources. In Canada, the frequency of the sources is 60 Hz in the power network. So the power is oscillating with 120 Hz of frequency. Look at how. The black curve represents the voltage in a certain impedance. And the blue curve is the current. Immediately we realize, hey, the current is lagging behind a voltage you see. And the voltage leads on and reaches its peak way before the current does. But when we multiply this voltage of the black curve by the current, the blue curve, we get power. And that power is plotted here with a red curve. Observe that indeed the power in that impedance is not constant. It is a sinusoid oscillating twice as fast as the voltage or the current. More. That power is sometimes positive, like here, and sometimes the power is negative. So that means that that load is absorbing power most of the time between this point in time and this point in time, and then spends a little time from here to there absorbing negative power, which it, what means it's returning energy back to the source. If we compute the area um, below the curve, this one, 
that is the energy absorbed by the load between this point here and this point here. And this little area, negative area, represents energy that the load returns to the generator, to the battery, to the source. So, in every power cycle, the load is absorbing a lot of energy, all of this, and then goes ahead and returns a little bit of energy back to the generator, to the battery, to the power supply. So, we're saying, hey, hey, check this out, check this out. This little energy here, yeah, it is like a ping pong ball of energy, it's ping pong power. It's energy the load is taking from the generator and then ping-ponging back to the generator half a cycle, a power cycle, later. So, there is actual power that is flowing always in one direction, that is the average of that power, and then there is that little bit of energy that is flowing back and forth, and we average, if we average that ping-pong energy per second, we get ping-pong power. The only thing is we give it a different name. We call that reactive power. Why? Because that is related mostly to reactive elements. It's energy that has to do with capacitors and with inductors. Those are reactive elements. That's why that ping-pong power is reactive power. What about the average power? Well, we call that the active power. A power P of t, a function of time that is positive most of the time, and negative some of the time, we have said that. The conclusion was that impedances in general absorb some average power, and we call that active power, P. And play ping-pong power with the sources using some of the power that we call the reactive power, Q. The way to compute the average power turned out to be in a previous class was the product of the RMS volt times the RMS amps multiplied by that power factor. And the units are watts. That is the average power, that is the active power. That is the power we can actually bill the customer for. Hey sir, you have absorbed so many joules per second in average all this month. Now pay me. And what about that ping pong power, the reactive power? Well, we compute that also by this uh, the, uh, very simple formula. RMS volts, RMS amps, and the sine of the same angle. We call this the reactive power factor. The units are conventional volt ampere reactives, VARS. Well, that is fine. That is a reality. But before the reality, something was apparent. AC voltmeters were reading RMS volts, and AC ammeters were reading, and they still do, all of those instruments, RMS amps. So the first attempt at computing power, of course, it made sense, was to multiply RMS volts times RMS amps to obtain power, right? And they did that. But then it turned out to be that that was not really the average power that they could build the customer for, no. The average power, the active power, P, was only a fraction of that apparent power. So they call that product RMS volts, RMS amps, they call that S, the apparent power. And just to make a distinction, they say the units are volt amperes, VAs, KVAs, MVAs. Just the product of two real numbers, one that comes straight from the voltmeter and another comes directly from the ammeter. Well, power triangle and the power factor A, yeah. From the formulas for apparent power, VI, the active power P, VI cosine, and the reactive power Q, VI sine, it made sense to have a graphical reminder of the relationship between the three, which turn out to be a right triangle. Check it out. Those are the formulas, right? Apparent power, VI, active power, VI cosine, reactive power, VI sine. Well, it is as if they were the sides of a right triangle like this with an angle here, theta, which is the difference in phase between the voltage alpha and the current beta. Apparent power S on the top, yeah, active power P on the bottom and reactive power Q. Please observe uh, that I'm calling them just a VI, right? Because we know that in AC, V is always RMS 
and if it has a hat then it's a phaser right but without the hat that is just the rms value of the voltage and i without a hat is just the rms value of the current so writing this subscript rms was fine for the first slides but now it's redundant so there you go your power triangle which is just a mnemonics to remember the relationship between apparent power by hypotenuse active power just a fraction of that the lower side and the reactive or ping pong power which is on the front out of s the apparent power only a percent turns out as actual power with that we can build the customer what percent the power factor that's right and that tells you what percent of the brain power turns out as active power that power factor because it's a cosine could be as small as zero when um, alpha minus beta is 90 degrees as in the case of an inductor or in the case of a capacitor when it's negative 90 degrees or it could be as big as one when alpha is equal to beta when the voltage and the currents are in phase the cosine is one that happens with resistors and in that case the power factor is one and all the apparent power becomes active power in those cases of course because the sign of zero is zero resistors deal nothing in ping pong power resistors don't play ping pong for an inductive load q is positive and the triangle is right side on we call this the power triangle right right however for a capacitive load q this one turns out to be negative check it out yeah in um, an uh, inductive load uh, then a beta is leading this angle is negative and the sign is a negative number and q is a negative number for a capacitive load q the reactive power is negative and the triangle is upside down the power triangle please do not forget that how about complex power well once you take out that triangle that we've seen in previous slides it made sense to try to find a mathematical container that had the three of them easy you say s p and q hey i can write that as a complex number s with a real part p and an imaginary p part q please observe that the complex power is a container it contains two numbers two real numbers p and q one is a real part the other is an imaginary part please pretty please never call q imaginary power because it's not imaginary that is a real power that is a power that has to do with bouncing real energy between generators and the customer call that reactive power right that is its true name reactive power or you can call the imaginary of the complex power but that's still a real number q well that is the rectangular way of writing the complex power real part p imaginary part q but we can also write that in polar form with a magnitude an absolute value as the apparent power and an angle which is the power factor angle alpha minus beta right 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 so s is vi and theta is alpha minus beta but this is the same as multiplying two complex numbers v alpha and i negative beta isn't that so yeah you get that but the first one is no one else about the voltage phaser and this one here is the complex conjugate of the current phaser check it out so we have arrived at a very simple formula the complex power that is a container for p and q can be computed with only one mathematical operation multiply the voltage phaser times the complex conjugate of the current phaser of course all of this is predicated with the assumption that we are using ieee standard phasers which are rms phasers if you insist on using peak value phasers which are favorites of textbooks in that case please you have to divide the whole expression by two but that is not an industrial standard in power and that is another way we do that with ieee the institute of electrical and electronic engineering now let's have a look at some power formulas in a c state state that will simplify our lives that formula complex power s is equal to 
the phasor V times the complex conjugate of the phasor I is all right. It works every single time. There are no exceptions. However, personally, I really like much simpler real numbers formulas uh, that apply specifically for resistors or specifically for reactors. Let's see what I'm talking about. In a resistor, if we know the current and it has an RMS value I and it has a phase beta, we know immediately from Ohm's law that the voltage in that resistor is Ri. That voltage has um, um, a magnitude Ri and the same phase. The power in the resistor will be given by the formula V conjugate of I. And that is just that uh, voltage Ri times the current I conjugate. But we remember that when we multiply in a complex number by its conjugate, all we get is the square of its absolute value, which happens to be the square of the RMS value of the current. So the power in a resistor is just a real number, Ri square, where I is the RMS value of the current in a resistor. And that is fine. And that is super cool. What about Q? Well, Q obviously is zero for the resistor, right? This is just a real number. No imaginary part, all real, that's right. Yeah, the power, the active power in the resistor is Ri squared, RMS values, right? And Q is always zero. More formulas for you to demonstrate. In a resistor, you can also compute the absorbed power using the voltage, the RMS voltage in the resistor, this way. Q continues to be zero in the resistor, but if you happen to know, you happen to know, and that the RMS volt in the resistor is V, you square those RMS volts, divide by R, and you get P. So you use either this formula or this one, depending on whether you know the current RMS or the RMS volts in a resistor R. What about in a reactor, in a capacitor, or an inductor? Well, before doing anything else, let's define the reactance of an inductor of a capacitor. Check it out. The reactance of an inductor is going to be a real number, omega L. And the reactance of a capacitor is also a real number, negative 1 over L omega C. The impedance of the capacitor is Jxc. The impedance of an inductor is J omega L. But that is another story. We're not talking of the impedance. We're talking only of the reactance, which is a real number. It's the imaginary part of the impedance of the element. And why I'm defining it like that? Because if I do that, I can express the power in a reactor with these very simple formulas. P, the active power in a reactor, is always zero always zero. The reactive power in the reactor, capacitors or inductors, can be computed as Xi squared RMS carries, right? RMS, RMS amps, I mean, squared, if we know the current in the reactor, or if we know the RMS of volts in the reactor, V squared divided by X, where X is defined in this way for the capacitor, and that way for the inductor. RMS values. Remember, those formulas have to do only with RMS values. You get them directly from the voltmeter, directly from the ammeter, or directly from the absolute value of the IEEE RMS phase. Okay, <clears throat> now let's go to the power factor again. The title of this slide is low power factor, bad. When the load absorbs a great amount of Q, compared with how much P it's absorbing, the power utility suffers. Check this out. See how much Q this load is absorbing, compared to the P it's buying from the company? Well, that is not very good, right? What is the power factor in this case? First of all, this is an inductive load. It is a lagging load, because the triangle, the power triangle is right side up. Q is positive. Cool. But the power factor in this case is the cosine of 45 degrees, which is 71% inductive or lagging. Now, when the power factor is high, that is good. That is good for the company. When the load absorbs a small amount of Q compared to the power P, the active power, the power utility profits because less of its cables, transformer windings, 
generator winding saw used to play ping pong with the customer for a power that he or she is not going to pay for, right? As in this case, right? Q is whatever it is, but compared to P, is rather small. In this case, the power factor of, is a cosine of 10 degrees, which is 98%, again, inductive or lagging, which is the same thing. As long as P is the same, the actual work done is the same. So the industry, the motor, the device absorbing some P that it converts into heat and work. But Q, the reactive power is there only to feed in magnetic fields and, and electric fields that are needed as part of the process, but they keep building up and uh, destroying them all the time during the every cycle of the AC system. We want to reduce the quid delivered by the power utility, right? But how do we do that? Well, here's the answer. Power factor correction. We take the original load. It absorbs some active power P. It absorbs some original reactive power Q old. And then we compute what should be the new Q if we are, if you are to achieve this new power factor. The difference between the, the original Q and the new Q we will call the capacitive Q. That is the Q supplied by a capacitor in parallel with the load and therefore at the same voltage as the load. Check it out. The Q supplied by the capacitor is Q old minus the Q new, what we really want to be the final reactive power supply by the utility. But we know that the absorbed Q in the capacitor is the negative of that, right? Because it's absorbed. And that Q in the capacitor is given by this formula, Vrma squared divided by X. And given the value for X for a capacitor, that is negative omega C Vrma squared. From that, we can solve for the capacitor value, which we hardly ever do actually in power systems. We are content with saying we need so many um, kilobars of capacitance to compensate and correct this power factor. Um, but if we insist in the question of what is the value in farads for the capacitance that you need to add to the load in parallel to it to bring down the power factor to such and such, then that is the Q cap, whatever it's needed to supply by the capacitor divided by the negative of omega that you take from the sources times the RMS volts of the factory squared. Graphically, this is the situation. The factory is absorb, absorbing this active power and this reactive power. That's why I call that the Q old. That means that the factory has this apparent power as old. But now we want that the new situation is this. This is all the Q I want to supply from the utility. So that means I want that the utility sees this new apparent, apparent power. Observe that P hasn't changed because the factory is still doing the same amount of work, right? But now the difference between Q old and Q new, of course, that's going to be the Q supplied by the capacitor. And that's right. And with that, we use the formulas that we have before and obtain what is the capacitance. Q cap divided by negative omega V squared. V RMS volts. Now, a question with a solution. Normally in class, this would go on a top hat question, but I will answer it for you. Let's say we have an industrial load and it's absorbing 400 kVA. I don't need to say that this is a prime power because the units give it away. KVA. What else can it be? Potatoes? No, that's a prime power. It absorbing that 400 kVA of a prime power at a power factor inductive. They have to tell us it's inductive of 40% at a voltage of 5 kilovolts. To improve the power factor up to 85% inductive, what should be the Q delivered? and what should be the capacitance of the necessary capacitor that we need to connect in parallel with that industry. We want to go from 40% to 85%. P cannot change. P has to do with the actual useful work done by the factory. So check this out. 400 
kVA of a prime power, that is the hypotenuse of the power triangle. The power triangle is right side up because the power factor is inductive, 40%, so the cosine of this angle is 0 0.4. The hypotenuse is 400, so that means this is 400 times 0 0.4, 160 kilowatts. That cannot change. That is the active power that is absorbed by that factory, 160 kilowatts. But now we can compute what is the Q absorbed by the factory as it is. You say that is the 400 multiplied by the sine of the angle whose cosine is 0 0.4, that is 367 kilobars, that's right. However, we want that in the end, the power factor is 85%. Yeah. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, we can compute what is the new Q. How? Well, P is going to be the same, 160 kilowatts. But now, if we multiply this by the tangent of the new theta angle, what angle? All the tangent of the arcosine of 0 0.85, because that is the new power factor. That's going to give us this QN 99.2 kilovars. The difference between the old Q absorbed by the, by the factory and the QN that we want to be provided by the power utility is that difference when the capacitor needs to supply. You see, 367 kilovars minus 99.2 kilovars, that is 267.5 kilovars. And that is the first part of the answer. And normally in the power uh, industry environment, that will be all you need to supply. However, in this exercise, they ask, what is the capacitance of that capacitor? Sure, that would be that Q of the capacitor divided by omega times the square of the voltage of the capacitor, which is this 5,000 volts squared. That is 28.4 microfarads. You understood all of this? I'm sure that you did, right? Let's see, show me. This is for you to do. And whom? An industrial load absorbs 400 kVA at a power factor inductive of 40% at 5 kilovolts. So it's the same problem as before. In reality, it is absolutely the same. The only thing I've changed is that instead of having a final power factor of 85% inductive, no, I want you to do something about that factory so that the final power factor is 85% capacitive. How's that? What should be the Q delivered by the capacitor and the capacitance of that capacitor? And that is all. Thank you very much and I hope to see you again in the next movie.